Many health professionals out there will tell you heart disease began skyrocketing in the 1900s because we were eating more meat. This is just simply not true because there was data that came from the USDA and NHANES research. They conducted a survey and they found that in the year 1800, humans were consuming on average about 225 pounds of meat, of red meat, per person every single year. Think about that, 225 pounds of red meat per person every single year. This number of red meat slowly and steadily decreased until the year 1900 when humans were consuming roughly 125 pounds of red meat every single year. That was nearly cut in half. In 2007, humans are still consuming roughly about 125 pounds of red meat per person every single year. Red meat continues to fall, but heart disease continues to rise. But it's pretty safe to say that heart disease was all but rare until about the 20th century in the 1900s. Heart disease wasn't at epidemic proportions like it is today. Even one of the founding professors of John Hopkins Hospital, William Osler, he didn't report any cases of heart disease during his work in the 1870s and 1880s. So either he just really missed it or there really wasn't any heart disease. Now it's also worth noting at this point in time in the early 1900s and the 1910s, the 1920s, a plant-based diet was really Really being pushed into culture by none other than John Harvey Kellogg. Yes, the guy that created cereal. He created cereal, Kellogg cereal, not because of any health reasons, but it was because of religious reasons and to prevent people from masturbating, to make people sterile. There was a lot of messed up things that he was doing to push his religious beliefs into culture. Highly recommend checking out that. So there was a lot of programming going on into the American mind to eat a more plant-based diet at this point in time. Not to mention, uh, Procter & Gamble had just come out with their cookbook, The Story of Crisco. Crisco had just made an appearance. This is hydrogenated seed oils. All of these things were taking place at this point in the early 1900s. Coca-Cola had just made an appearance and sugar consumption had skyrocketed. So all of this is taking place within just 20 to 30 years in the early 1900s. And at this point, by 1921, heart disease had just been listed as the number one cause of death in Americans. So it was virtually non-existent before the year 1900. But then all of a sudden in 1921, it's the leading cause of death, killing hundreds of thousands of Americans, mainly middle-aged men. Now with that kind of line of thinking, one common objection that I do hear often is that our ancestors didn't live long enough to get heart disease. Their average lifespan was 30 to 40 years old. So if they lived beyond that, then they were gonna develop heart disease. But this is just not true. By the year 1900, not that long ago, about one fifth of the total US population was over 50 years old, which means there were over tens of millions of Americans over prime heart attack age that simply didn't suffer from heart attacks. So why all of the sudden did humans just start getting heart attacks to epidemic proportions. So as we progress throughout the 1900s, by the year 1961, there was a ton, a ton of pressure on the American Heart Association and other governmental agencies to address the growing heart disease epidemic. It was still a number one killer. Stroke was a number two killer closely behind. And at this point in 1961, Ansel Keys, he joined the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee, and he joined the NIH, the National Institute of Health panel, and he also appeared on the cover of Time Magazine. Now, he was very prominent in pushing forward saturated fat is bad, and to reduce your consumption of red meat and other animal products because it raised your total cholesterol. There was a lot of science being done at this point in time. Keys had launched his six country study and seven country study. The American Heart Association was conducting some science. Now, staying in this decade of the 1970s, the American Heart Association, NIH, Ansel Keys, all these researchers are trying to conduct studies that would be the nail in the coffin to prove that the diet heart hypothesis is correct. Well, one of those studies that was conducted is the Minnesota Coronary Survey. This is the largest ever randomized controlled trial on the diet heart hypothesis. This isn't an association, this isn't observational, this is an intervention was given, and this one thing can prove if it caused an outcome or not. So what researchers did was they gathered 9,000 men and women in six different Minnesota state hospitals and one nursing home, and this study lasted for four and a half years. 
9,000 men and women in a randomized controlled trial is a lot. This doesn't happen in nutrition research. And it should be noted that this can't really be done today due to ethical reasons. So this is one of the best studies, if not the best study, showing if cholesterol saturated fat causes heart disease. Because they sourced their 9,000 men and women from hospitals and nursing homes, this was a very, very well documented and controlled study. They could control for virtually every factor that was going on in their lives. They knew what exactly what foods they were getting, when they were getting it. And the researchers reported a 100% partition rate. Nobody dropped out of this study. What they did was they divided these 9,000 men and women into two separate groups. One group was fed traditional American food with at least 18% saturated fat and cholesterol in their diet. The other group got soft margarine, so seed oils, in place of their butter, whole egg substitute, low fat beef and dairy products filled with seed oils. You can pretty much think of Oatly with the canola oil in the, in the plant-based milk. Here's the thing, both diets had the same amount of total fat, total fat in their diet, a certain percentage came from fat, but the intervention group had half the amount of saturated fat and limited their cholesterol. What the authors found when they concluded this four and a half year randomized controlled trial was that there were absolutely no differences between the two groups for cardiovascular events cardiovascular deaths, or total mortality. It didn't make a difference. But one thing that they noted was that cancer was a lot higher in the low fat group. And maybe most interestingly and kind of sinister is that this study was completed in 1973, but it wasn't published until 16 years later in a relatively unknown medical journal where the authors knew nobody would find it. So they just hid it. They couldn't undo it. It didn't go the way they wanted. So they just hid the science. Well, now they had more evidence showing that reducing meat, reducing dietary cholesterol, reducing saturated fat, it didn't work. And it actually potentially increased their risk of getting cancer. Fast forward after these studies were conducted by the American Heart Association in 1977. Now the American Heart Association, unfortunately, went on to release their dietary goals. This was virtually the first official report anywhere in the world advising Americans to eat lean meats, limit saturated fat, limit dietary cholesterol, lower salt consumption, and increase carbohydrate consumption to 60% of total calories. Because at this point in time, the American Heart Association was the leading authority on heart prevention, heart protection, heart health. They were very pressured to get information out to the public because heart disease was a number one killer, strokes was a second number two killer. They had to get their recommendations out to the public because in 1969, President Eisenhower had just died from a heart attack and heart disease was the number one killer, killing hundreds of thousands of Americans at this point. And they said the best available evidence that they had was to limit saturated fat, lower cholesterol, and increase more plants in your diet. And since the American Heart Association released their report in 1977, now Congress had to get involved. The American government had to get involved. So what they did was in 1980, Congress appointed the USDA as the lead agency on American nutrition. Coincidentally though, it had some of the same individuals that were on the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee. So what do you think the American government is gonna recommend? They had the same minds on the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee making the same recommendations for them for their own dietary goals. So in 1980, the USDA released their first ever publication of the dietary guidelines for Americans. This would soon become known as the ever popular food pyramid in the 1990s and more recently, my plate in the 2000s. Despite all the evidence that suggested that dietary cholesterol was not a problem, all the research that was done on humans, even by Ansel Keys himself, who was on the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee, despite all that research that was done, the USDA dietary guidelines went on to say to limit dietary cholesterol as much as possible. So over the following years, since 1980, this is the pivotal moment in human history where things now became marketed as cholesterol-free, low cholesterol, fat-free, and low fat. Coincidentally, 1980 is also when obesity, type two diabetes, dementia, and other chronic diseases really began skyrocketing. It's just a really weird coincidence. We really started upping our carbohydrate consumption to 55 to 60% of our total calories and lowered our meat consumption, lowered our animal fat consumption, and all of a sudden, all these other virtually unknown 
chronic health conditions started arising. But now fast forward from 1980 to 1992, there might just be justice for dietary cholesterol. It might be vindicated once and for all. In 1992, the largest study ever conducted on this subject was released in a very prestigious medical journal, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This study was titled, Effects of Dietary Cholesterol on Serum Cholesterol, a Meta-Analysis and Review. Authors looked at every study on this subject. Does dietary cholesterol impact your blood, your serum cholesterol, your total cholesterol? And what they found is for the overwhelming vast majority of individuals, dietary cholesterol from red meat, butter, egg yolks, has no impact on total blood cholesterol levels. So immediately, countries started following suit and removing any limitations on consuming dietary cholesterol. Virtually, you could consume as much cholesterol as you wanted and it made no difference. However, that same year in 1992, that's when the Food Guide Pyramid was launched. And in that Food Guide Pyramid, it advised Americans to continue to lower dietary cholesterol even more, even though this meta-analysis had just shown that it was not problematic. Our own government kept advising us to lower it even more. Until 2015, when the USDA finally released another report of their dietary guidelines for Americans. In that report, it was buried on page 91 of the 572 page report. And they quietly announced in one line, cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. And just like that, with that one line, they essentially backtracked on everything they have been recommending for the past 60 years. However, you can go up and down any aisle of your grocery store today, and you will still see products labeled cholesterol-free or low cholesterol, fat-free, low fat. It gives you and I, the consumer, the impression that eating cholesterol is still a problem. And to individuals out there that don't have any formal nutrition education, this type of marketing can easily fool them into thinking that that is a health food. When usually foods that are labeled low cholesterol or fat free are typically foods that are higher in sugar, higher in refined carbs, higher in man-made chemicals, higher in foods that are going to cause a lot of metabolic dysfunction and foods that contain virtually no nutrition in them. Throughout this entire history, you can see how animal foods like red meat, butter, and egg yolks have been wrongly vilified for a few generations, about 100 to 150 years, they've been wrongly vilified. And more recently in the past 70 years is really when we started to see staggering rates of chronic illnesses because we are trying to treat symptoms rather than treat the root cause.